Hello, Ashley. Where is Jack? <laughs> Hello. Yeah, yeah, please. Yes. Okay. Here we have Ashley. Um, but before your talk, can you tell me something about drumming? Are you good at that? In a past life, I was a drummer. I ah, studied, oh. studied drumming at college, and I okay. wanted to be a rock and roll star. Yeah. And clearly, that didn't work out. <laughs> so, okay, so you have this kind of spirit in you. Yeah, uh, yeah, I've always been creative, music, design, tech. Awesome, that means that this presentation is going to, is going to be like super good. I hope so. Oh, yeah, we'll I believe see. so. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Okay, hello everybody. Thanks. My name's Ashley. It's great to be here all the way from sunny Scotland. Uh, now, I have a lot to get through, so I'm not going to waste too much time on lengthy introductions. If you want to know anything about me, the best place to go is Twitter. I am Ashley on Twitter. But to give this talk some context, I will tell you what it is that I do professionally. So I am building with Jack. 44% of freelancers will be stung by a bad client. So I'm building a platform that helps them financially and legally if that happens. Now in simpler terms, it's business insurance for freelancers. Today I'm talking about going from idea to execution and what to expect beyond that. And I will of course draw on my experience of building and launching with Jack. So think of it as a bit of a case study of sorts with lots of practical tips that you can apply to whatever it is that you're building. Now it is worth mentioning that I am speaking about this stuff from the perspective of a solo founder. I don't have a co-founder. I wish I did. I'm incredibly lonely, but I've just never met the right person to build stuff with. And apparently the odds are stacked against you if you're a solo founder. But my opinion is that it's better to be a solo founder than have the wrong co-founder that's going to cause problems way down the line. I have funded this by going out at the weekend and photographing weddings or taking on any kind of photo work that I could get. And that's really how I funded the initial design and development costs of building this. And lastly, it's a company of one. I'm the only full-time person working on this. But for anything that does fall outside of my skill set, I'm working with an amazing team of freelancers which is handy considering we're building the service for them. So yeah, bootstrapping a business as a solo founder in one of the least startup friendly industries in the world. I still haven't figured out if that makes me incredibly brave or very stupid. I'll get back to you on that. So let's kick things off and talk about your idea and how the what you end up building can be very different from the initial concept that you came up with. So I have to admit that the idea that I came up with and the problem that I wanted to solve is very different to the problem that I believe With Jack is solving today and that it's okay for these things to change and evolve over time. So I had been working in insurance for eight long years before I started thinking about what would eventually become with Jack. And from those eight years, I noticed a lot of problems in the insurance industry. I'm only going to share two of them today, otherwise we'd be here all day. The first is that insurers aren't investing money into their technology. Now things are getting better these days. There's a lot of conversation happening around technology in the insurance industry. There are a lot of interesting insure tech startups appearing. But 74% of insurance companies see technological innovation as a challenge. And yet few are developing their own offerings in-house or partnering up with these startups. So what that translates to me is that most insurers see technology as a challenge, but they aren't really prepared to do anything about it. And the second problem 
was that shopping for insurance sucks. It's such a bad experience for all of us. And most of the time, we don't even understand what it is we've bought. And two out of three customers are unhappy with their journey through buying insurance. So these were the problems that I saw and I personally felt quite excited about and wanted to do something about. So from there I thought, well, I'll build a digital insurance platform with great design and technology at its core and make the process as painless as possible. But there was just one small issue with that. Nobody cares. So I am targeting freelancers. And I can tell you that freelancers are not going to Google and typing in business insurance for freelancers, but from an insurance company that's websites powered by React or whatever the latest tech framework is. Like, yes, people want nicer checkout experiences and better onboarding, but nobody is searching for insurance companies off the back of what tech stack they're using. So these, this idea that I came up with and these problems that I wanted to solve, they weren't pressing enough to have the two million freelancers in the UK flocking to sign up to with Jack. And when I finally realized that, and by the way, it took me a long time to realize that, I'm quite a slow learner, but when I finally figured that out, I went on this... Uh, this journey of exploration to figure out what problem with Jack is solving, but from a pain point, customer-driven perspective. And to get there, I had to do a few things. So firstly, I had to stop thinking off with Jack as an insurance company, which was really hard to do given I'd spent my entire adult life working in insurance. And instead, I had to start asking the question, well, why are my customers giving me their money? Why are they signing up? And this wasn't some hypothetical question that I just asked myself. I did actually speak to my customers, video chats, face-to-face -face onboarding surveys. And I was saying to them, so why did you sign up to With Jack? And I was getting a lot of nice answers to this question that massaged my ego and made me feel really good about what I was building. Like people complimenting the onboarding, talking about the slick quote process or that I'd made things simpler and easier to understand. And whilst all of that made me feel pretty good about what I was building, none of it really told me why they were using with Jack. So I stopped asking, why did you sign up? And instead I started asking, what benefits have you received since signing up? And the answers that I got to that question were completely different. People were now talking about being able to sleep at night because they knew that if they made a mistake in their work, they were protected or that they just felt like a more confident freelancer because they knew that if they did ever have any confrontations with a client, they personally wouldn't have to suffer the financial consequences because they had insurance. So these conversations led me to this realization that uh, this idea that I came up with to build a website where freelancers could easily buy insurance, that's actually not what I am doing. I am not in the insurance business. What I did realize is that with Jack is in the business of keeping freelancers in business. And suddenly reframing this idea and the problem that I'm solving has changed everything about what I'm building. It's changed our messaging from business insurance on a first name basis to how we can help you be a confident freelancer. It's opened up more verticals because being an insurance company limits me to building a website that sells insurance, but creating a platform that helps to keep freelancers in business means that I can explore other avenues like potentially connecting freelancers to qualified leads so they're getting consistent work or a number of other things. So some takeaways here, if you're at the idea stage now, it's really important that you acknowledge that what you end up building can be very different to that initial concept. So 
please do not be too married to a particular idea. Don't be too precious about your ideas to the point that you have tunnel vision. Instead, allow yourself to go on this journey of exploration that should begin with talking to customers or, if you're pre-launch, potential customers. Secondly, stop thinking of things solely from the perspective of an industry expert. That will really limit how you're thinking about what it is you're building. It's the mistake that I made. I was thinking of with Jack as an insurance professional who has 10 years of experience in that industry, instead of from that pain point perspective of a freelancer. And make sure you're asking your customers the right questions or potential customers. That's really important. If the questions you're asking serve no purpose other than to make you feel good about what you're building, you're asking the wrong questions. And that simple change in the question I asked, why did you sign up to With Jack? Had people talking about the pleasant customer journey to what benefit did you receive? had people sharing their emotional response as to why they were becoming customers. So we all get it drilled into us from day one to do as much validation as possible before we spend too much time writing code. And I think that's great advice. It's a really good idea to figure out if people want what it is you're building before you've become too emotionally or financially invested in it. I have made that mistake. So five years ago, I built a SaaS app and I spent thousands of pounds working with a designer to making this product look great and it did look great. And a few months into building it, I became a much more proficient and confident programmer. So I went back and refactored all my code despite having zero users. So nine months later, I finally launched this thing. And by the way, might I remind you that as a woman, I can create human life in that time. But I finally launched this app to crickets, and to this day, I've made zero pounds in revenue. So I would never make that mistake again. However, that playbook that we're all taught of starting small and testing ideas quickly and cheaply doesn't actually apply to all of us. It certainly doesn't apply to me. I'm building something in a regulated industry where there are a lot of rules to adhere to and barriers. So if you're building something in insurance, healthcare, banking, financial services, a number of other sectors, it becomes really difficult to follow that playbook of testing ideas quickly and cheaply. Now, just to give you a bit more context, in the UK, we're regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. And to get a license from them takes between six to 12 months and costs upwards of 10,000 pounds. And that is a lot of time and money to spend on something before you've even validated that you can make money doing it. So that was the problem that I had. And I need to figure it out. I needed to answer two questions. I needed to find out if businesses would give me money for this and what kind of businesses would give me money for this. So to start figuring that out quickly and cheaply, I signed up as an affiliate for an insurance broker. And what that meant was that I didn't have to become authorized by the FCA because I was under their umbrella of authorization. And this meant that I could build and launch a landing page really quickly and start to gauge interest and see if I could monetize it. But it came with a lot of downsides. So the first was that I couldn't build my own tech, which was one of the problems that I wanted to solve. You might remember I talked about creating a better customer journey. But users would land on this page and they were met with a really striking brand that looked nothing like anything else in insurance at the time. And when they got to that point where they thought, OK, yeah, I like this and this could be useful for my business. Let's see how much it costs. They would click the call to action, get a quote, and they were taken away to the insurance broker's website. And this had different branding, different messaging, different copy, different tone of voice. And that stuff matters. So it left the user experience really disjointed 
and it left users feeling really dissatisfied and confused. The second problem, arguably an even bigger problem, was that I didn't know who my customers were. So because I was an affiliate, I technically didn't own the customer. And because I wasn't authorized by the FCA, I wasn't allowed access to that data. So people were landing on this page and they were converting, but I had no idea who they were. I couldn't have customer conversations. I couldn't make better decisions for the business based on who was buying from me because I had no idea who was buying from me. So I had to start thinking of ways around that, how I could figure this stuff out. And uh, one of the things I did, a very simple fix, was before sending people away to the insurance broker's website, I asked for their email address. And people thought that this was part of the onboarding. It wasn't. It's probably not GDPR compliant. And uh, even back then, it wasn't something that I felt comfortable doing. But it was the only way that I could get an idea of what kind of businesses were wanting to use this service. So this landing page that I built wasn't positioned to freelancers. I just cast a wide net and said, hey, we're for businesses. So it could be startups, it could be micro SMEs, freelancers. And because most businesses use an email address with a custom domain, it meant that I was able to start collecting hundreds of websites to visit that would help me build a picture of the type of business that was wanting to use this. And it turns out, it was overwhelmingly freelancers. So I knew that if I could perfect the customer journey and really learn how to position this to freelancers, then I was potentially onto a business. And that's how I validated things. So this landing page, it was uh, full of flaws. It wasn't perfect, it didn't solve any big problems, but it helped me to answer two questions. It helped me to define my target audience and it helped me see if I could make money doing this. Now, you might not be building something in a regulated industry, but let's face it, a lot of the low-hanging fruit has already been done, so a lot of us are moving into industries or coming up with ideas that are a bit more complex, and you might have to think outside the box and do a few hacks or workarounds to validate it. I'm gonna share some examples that I've seen other people use to validate their ideas. One of them is Twitter, be it sending out a tweet or doing a Twitter poll. Granted, I do think you have to have a pretty big audience to glean any kind of insightful data from it. And even then, I'd take it with a pinch of salt. But Paul Jarvis is a great example of this. He had an idea for simple and trustworthy website analytics software. So he put a tweet out and said, if this gets enough traction, I'll build it. Spreadsheets, you can't get any simpler than that. That's how Nomad List started. And last I checked, Nomad List was doing 30K monthly recurring revenue. Email lists, that's how Product Hunt began life before it became a self-hosted community site. Of course, the classic approach, which is the one that I took, building a landing page, helped me to define my audience and see if I could make money doing it. And even blog posts. So John O'Nolan wrote a blog post about what he wanted from blogging, uh, blogging software, and he called it Ghost. And this blog post, within the first week, had several hundred thousand views. So at that point, John thought, OK, clearly I am onto something. And that was the validation he needed before moving on to the next step, which was creating a Kickstarter, which had almost 200,000 pounds in funding. So a lot of people say that the only metric for validation is money, and I do agree with that to an extent. Sometimes I do think it can be enough putting something out there and just seeing if it resonates with others. So you've come up with this idea, and you've defined the problem that you're solving, and you've even validated it, you've built it, it's time to get it out there and share it with the world except you're feeling like you have shipping anxiety. This is something that I think a lot of us deal with. It's certainly something that I experience. And the way that I define shipping anxiety is that when it comes to sharing this thing that you have created with the world, you feel apprehensive or hesitant about it for a number of reasons. Maybe it doesn't have as many features as you want. Maybe the code isn't as clean or as fast as you want. Or maybe you're just worried 
about what other people will think of it. So this was something that I experienced when launching with Jack. I was really embarrassed about the first version of it. It was so far from the vision that I had, and it was incredibly bare bones compared to my competitors, uh, which all have multiple products and features, have, have automated the entire process, and have an average age of 96 years, so have a bit of a head start on me. In an ideal world, I would have shipped with a suite of insurance products. So any kind of product that would keep a freelancer in business with Jack would stock. There would be a dashboard to manage your insurance because every aspect of insurance should be digital, not just buying your policy, but making changes to it, monitoring the progress of your claim. There'd be instant quotes and cover because we all expect to buy most things online with just a few clicks of a button. And it would have a very polished customer journey from when somebody lands on the site through to completing a purchase. That is not how WithJack looked at launch. The reality was that I launched with just one product, professional indemnity insurance. Manual quotes, so there's a delay between somebody submitting their information and getting their price back because I have to log in and manually process things, which means I'm glued to my computer. Fun fact, by the way, the weirdest place that I've ever processed a quote and got a sale from was on top of a volcano in Spain. I made 200 pounds on that volcano. There was no dashboard, so again, I have to manually make these changes. And the customer journey was far from complete. So at launch, I focused on getting one thing relatively right from the start, which was this conversational form that we used to collect the details that we need about you. But there were other key parts of the journey that I hadn't even built. So if somebody actually wanted to buy insurance, and it turns out they did, by the way, then I was sending them to Typeform to complete the purchase. So I look at this and I think, well, I should have been embarrassed. Like, how could I launch when my competitors had multiple products? They'd built all of this tech to automate the entire process. And there I was with one product manually processing everything. But I actually want to talk about the surprising benefits of having to manually process things. So if you skip building all the tech and actually start to manually onboard your users, you'll end up having a lot of customer conversations. And you'll learn a lot from these conversations. You'll find out where people came from, what they thought of the experience, why they signed up, who referred them. You'll start to notice the language that they use when they talk about your product and the problem that it solves for them. And you can use that language to influence your copy, your design, or even what features you build next. And it'll also help you create deeper connections with those first customers. And I think that's really special. The conversion rate also has been surprisingly high. So I'm converting 40% of the people who get a quote to customers. And I don't know what the industry average is because insurance is not a transparent industry. Nobody shares these figures, uh, but I guarantee it won't be as high as that. And it shows that people actually don't mind that slight delay in between submitting their details and waiting for their price. And in fact, they quite like the human touch. And um, you will also start to notice common, you'll start to notice patterns like common confusions or questions that people are asking you. And then you can use that to create content or products to attract a wider audience to your product. And I'll share a couple of examples about how I've done that successfully for With Jack. So a lot of people who bought insurance were coming back to me and saying, is there anything else that I should be thinking about? Like, how can I better protect my business? So I created a tool that assesses the vulnerability of a freelancer's business and makes suggestions for them as to how they can better protect themselves. I also had a lot of people not even knowing what kind of insurance they should be buying. So I created this, another, again, a very simple tool where they answer a few questions and based on the information they've given me, I can then say, here are the products that you should consider and here's why based on the information you've given me. And both of those tools are massive lead generation resources for WithJack. 
So just a welcome reminder to all of us working in tech to stop obsessing over features, to stop obsessing over the tech that powers these features and to just get into the habit of shipping things, even if it does mean uh, bypassing uh, tech and doing things manually. And my challenge to you is that with the next product or feature that you build, ask yourself, can we do this manually instead of creating all of the tech to automate it? Uh, so I was using Typeform instead of building the solution myself. I was manually onboarding users. Buffer were emailing users when they were notified of a sale because they didn't launch with a payment solution. And even Stripe were delivering instant merchant accounts by manually adding users behind the scenes. So what happens when you launch? Well, you'll start to discover problems. And that's a good thing. There are certain problems that you'll only discover when whatever it is you've built is in the hands of real people and they're using it. So I'm going to share the process that I use to gather feedback and discover problems. So I use two tools to help me do this. One is Pipedrive, which is what I use to manage my sales funnel and most importantly, see when I should follow up with customers. And the second is iteratehq.com. And this is the tool that I use to collect feedback from customers or potential customers uh, via surveys. But they have a number of other features too, so check that out. Now, I aim to send somebody their quote within five to 10 minutes of them submitting their details. It isn't always possible because freelancers shop for insurance at crazy times, like two o'clock on a Saturday morning when I'm fast asleep. But if they don't buy insurance, if I don't hear back, I send a follow up one week later. And at this point, I'm just letting them know, hey, like, I really want to help you with your insurance. So let me know if you have any questions. At that point, a lot of people do uh, get in touch or buy insurance because they needed that simple nudge. Insurance is something we push to the back of our minds. But if I still don't hear back, I send my next script two weeks later, and this is the point that I'm really trying to extract data from them and find out what those barriers are as to why they never signed up. And I'll say, I'm sorry I wasn't able to help you with your insurance. I'd love to know why you never signed up so I can make WithJack better for other developers, and hopefully one day you. I'd really appreciate it if you could fill out this survey. It's completely anonymous and there are only three questions. As a small business tackling a big industry, this feedback really helps. Now, some people might be critical of me using a survey instead of asking for feedback, because if you're asking specific questions, you might be influencing the type of answers you get. However, I have tried asking for open-ended feedback and the response rate was abysmal. It still isn't particularly high with this. It never is going to be. These people aren't using your product. They're not that engaged with it. They're not that invested and don't care too much if it gets better. But what I do think works well about this script is, first of all, tailoring it as much as possible to that person. So that personal outreach, using their name and saying that I really want to make With Jack better for other developers and hopefully one day you. It makes them really feel like I am creating With Jack for them and their peers and they can really provide me with valuable feedback right now. Secondly, making a point of mentioning there are only three questions. Uh, I don't know how many times I've started filling out online surveys and I've got to the fifth or sixth question. I'm only 9% I'm only of the way through, so I abandon the process. But three questions, they know that that's only going to take them a couple of minutes and most people will give you a couple of minutes of their time. And using the fact that I'm a small business to my advantage, I'm not some big faceless corporation that's going to take this feedback and it's going to go into the abyss and I'm never going to do anything with it. So if you're a one woman startup, a two person product team, tell them you will get more feedback that way. So with this script and with the surveys, I've been able to get a 9% higher response rate than when I was just asking for open ended feedback. Now, we're all in different industries. We all have different audiences. So you'll want to experiment with your script, with your follow up times, with whether using surveys works or not. But this is what's worked for me. So what problems have I discovered? Well, I only have time to share one of them with you today. 
Very quickly post-launch, I discovered that I was losing a ton of customers due to price because when I launched, I didn't have the cheapest product on the market, which is a good thing. I don't want to sell cheap crap. But thanks to comparison sites, they've created this uh, price-driven buying behavior in insurance where people just want to look at a table of prices and choose the cheapest. But fortunately, because I'd implemented this process of gathering feedback, I was able to take all of that data to the insurer and say, look at how many customers we're losing via pipe drive, look at why we're losing them via iterate, and then they worked with me on establishing a better price point. So, a couple of points about this. Whatever means you use for outreaching with your customers, make sure that you personalize it as much as possible. If you can, mention the occupation, the industry they're in. Try to do it in a very personal manner. I do think that you'll get a higher response rate. Make sure you tap into the fact that you're a small business. You're not just some big faceless corporation that's asking for feedback to tick a box and look good. You genuinely care and their feedback can really help you shape what it is you're building. And also, if you have no luck with asking for feedback like I did, then try pointing people to a survey. Make sure you only ask a few questions. I ask three, I wouldn't ask any more than four or five, and keep those questions short. And use a tool like iteratehq.com to help you do that. Now, there are a ton of uh, moving pieces when it comes to building and launching something and making a success of it. And I haven't got it all figured out yet. Uh, but these are some of the things that I have learned, and I hope that you can apply some of it to whatever it is you're building. If you want to know more about me, I am Ashley on Twitter. The business that I'm building is withjack.co.uk. And I just want to say thank you for listening to somebody talk about insurance for half an hour. Thanks.